Welcome to the CISO series video chat. Uh, we're going to play a new game right up here. And now all I'm going to do is I'm going to start with uh, my guest here, Matthew Andriani. And uh, Matthew, uh, our topic is hacking DDoS. So just give me some basic good advice around dealing with a DDoS attack. Just some simple advice. What would you suggest? Make sure that your DDoS protection is working in an automated way. Make sure that you've got good DDoS protection deployed. Make sure that it works. All right. Now, Chris, I want you to do the opposite for me. Give me some really bad advice on how to deal with a DDoS attack. Uh, yeah. Anytime you have a DDoS attack, just uh, unplug the internet connection. Well, there you go. That won't really help at all. All right. Now, <laughs> Matthew, I want you to try to top that. I want you to give me some worst advice than what Chris just suggested. If you think you're going to have a DDoS attack, unclip the internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I like it. Before, before it gets there. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. The CISO series video chat is Very ready good. All to right. begin. Well, I want to welcome everybody to today's topic is hacking, distributed denial of service, an hour of critical thinking about how to predict, manage, and thwart massive traffic attacks. You just met our two guests. That's Chris Grundelman, who is the research category lead for networking and security over at GigaOM. And also Matthew Andriani, who's the founder and CEO over at Mazebolt. And guess what? Mazebolt, they're our sponsor for today's video chat. They're in the area of DDoS protection. You should know a little bit more about them. Uh, you can find more about them at mazebolt.com. But don't go there yet because you want to stick around for the video chat. All right. Seven different ways you can participate in our video chat. There's a chat room, which many of you have discovered already. You can submit your worst idea for thwarting a DDoS attack. Submit how to make it 10% better. How to, what can we do to improve DDoS mitigation? Uh, vote in our polls. Join us on video at any time by just typing, bring me on. So if you type in, bring me on, uh, Andrew, our producer, will try to bring you on. Ask a question at any time and vote for your favorite question as well. If you see at the bottom of the screen, there is a uh, option to ask a question as well. So here's today's uh, uh, schedule. You just saw we played the game, good advice, bad advice, worse advice. Uh, also, we want to know your bad ideas. So let's see if you can top the two of them. They were pretty bad ideas. An excellent job, by the way, Matthew, for one-upping Chris right there. Uh, how do we make it 10% better? Uh, just label it 10%. We want your ideas for making it better. And by the way, we always get overwhelmingly more bad ideas than we get good ideas. But as you know, if you have the best bad idea... Uh, you have an option, an opportunity to win one of these awesome CISO series jackets, uh, which we announce next week, the winner of that, uh, because so many bad ideas do come in. So please get your bad ideas in right now. In fact, send them in. We need your bad ideas. All right. We'll put up a poll for the worst idea for thwarting a DDoS attack. We'll play the game I Object. Jonathan Waldrop will be joining us later. We'll also play Department of Yes. We'll put up the poll live on how do we make it 10% better. Then the worst idea contenders will face off. Those will be the two best bad ideas as determined by you, the audience in the poll. And then last question, the final advice, and then we will have our meetup, which if you haven't uh, joined our meetup at the end of the show, it is a lot of fun. Get face-to-face -face time with your fellow attendees. Now, next Friday, that is the 28th, is our Hacking Data First Security uh, discussion, an hour of critical thinking about focusing your security program on data. The link to register for that is at the bottom of the screen. You at any time can click on that link and join us um, over on the, uh, you can join us, I'm sorry. Uh, you can join us, uh, I'm sorry. If you click on the link below, it'll open up another scheme. You can register for that, but it will not take you out of our video chat right now. That's what I want to say. So you can stay in our video chat. All right, the bad ideas are coming in already. I appreciate that. Please keep those bad ideas coming in for thwarting DDoS as well. All right, let's jump into our discussion right now. We are only four minutes into it. All right, let's start with this. I'll begin with you, Matthew. What entities play a part in dealing with a distributed denial of service? Uh, of, I mean, mitigation, not the ones who are attacking you. We kind of generally know, I'm assuming everyone knows how a DDoS attack happens. It's just lots and lots of requests to your server. Uh, but what... Uh, what are the different sort of entities that need to get involved here in sort of dealing with this? So typically in a DDoS protection posture, you have your DDoS mitigation vendors, which are either cloud uh, 
protection vendors or on-prem vendors, then that's one component. The other component is you also sometimes have testing vendors mm -hmm. that will run tests in maintenance windows against those protection vendors. Both, both of those do provide some level of protection, but the protection overall is, uh, we see, incomplete. And you'll still be relying on a third entity, unfortunately, uh, which is yourself, the, the person in charge of that network, where you may have to respond to a DDoS attack because both the DDoS mitigation vendor and testing that solution may not be enough to avoid a response scenario. All right. What would you answer to that question? And would you add to that, Chris? Well, I think the one thing to add would be the service provider. A lot of times you're taking care of a network that's attached to another network and the DDoS may need to traverse that network. And so they may have their own mitigation um, ahead of yours. Okay. And, and we've heard that a lot. And I know th that was a lot in um, your report. And I should mention that um, if you uh, if you want to know more in sort of overall in terms of the whole space, um, Gigom, uh, Chris Grundeman's company, and Chris worked on this, it has a whole report from Gigom on uh, DDoS mitigation and also key criteria, what to look for when you're looking for mm -hmm. a DDoS solution as well. And um, I don't know, if anyone from Gigom is watching this right now, if you can put those links to that here in the discussion, that would be awesome so people can see that. All right. So... Um, and also, please remember to ask questions if you, anybody has questions. Let's go to the next question. One of the major concerns, and I know this was mentioned by Alice here, because yesterday's um, Defense in Depth episode is also on this very topic uh, on uh, DDoS solutions, is his complaint, and I'm going to throw this to you first, Chris, is the lack of automation. And we do see automation in terms of it sort of thwarts a certain volume, but it doesn't speak to the customer's need of, I just still want to be operating without so much manual intervention. So currently, traditionally, what is manual? What is automatic? Yeah. So, I mean, it depends on what you're looking at and how traditionally you want to talk about. But a lot of it has been manual for a long time. Um, you know, and, and a lot of it's been a pretty blunt hammer as well, which is wait till you're getting attacked. Um, try and figure out what the, you know, manually look and see what the source of the attack is. And then block that and try to get your upstream to block it or, or tell your... Um, DDoS mitigation provider to block it. Now they may have some automation on their side, but a lot of times you're triggering it manually and, and asking them, hey, I'm, I'm under attack now, please help me, uh, versus it all just being kind of automatic. Now, obviously that's changing. And as we see with a, a lot of things, automation's growing more and more, but uh, for a long time, it's been very, very manual. All right. Uh, Matthew, what, what would you add to that? I think it's important to define what automation means. Hmm. Most of the clientele that we deal with, they have always on DDoS protection, which is upstream scrubbing centers and always on uh, CPE equipment. What, what our clientele believe automation means is that when a DDoS attack comes, it's automatically blocked. No one hears about it. And maybe they get a log or maybe they get informed that there was a major attack, but that nothing happens. That's automated DDoS protection. Mm -hmm. The moment that you have to have any manual process, as Chris said, involved, like a need to trigger that protection to turn on. That all equates to downtime. If an attack arrived and you're always on DDoS protection, did not automatically block it, block it and you have an emergency response team respond to that, that's not automated protection. So automated protection is really only the attacks that are mitigated without any SLA impact to your environment. That's automated DDoS protection. And that's what... You Okay. And, and let me, I'm sorry, I'm going to say my ignorance here in that I kind of assumed that DDoS protection was automatic, I think, because I felt that it, that's how it was sold to us. Um, but can we isolate, and I'm sorry, I'm going back a little bit more to what we just said, and give me some like real world examples of when the manual process traditionally has to come in. And again, I understand, Matthew, that your solution, Mazebolt, is not allowing for that. So... Uh, I'm interested to know from both of you, I'll start again with you, Chris, of give me an example of it. And then Matthew explained how Mazebolt is eliminating that element. So Chris, go ahead. Yeah. So again, traditionally, a, a lot of solutions, you know, and, and, and some of this has gotten better over time, but a lot of solutions, you had to first be getting attacked and, and know that you were getting attacked. And then, you know, either there's a couple of different ways, right? One way is just really simple, maybe do some remote triggered black holing where you're telling your service writer, hey, I'm getting attacked on this address, please block all the traffic that's coming into your network to this address. 
or hopefully if you've got a, a scrubbing center or something, a lot of times there was this manual switch over where maybe you don't want to run your traffic through the scrubbing center all the time for whatever various limitations they may have had. And so you actually switch your internet feed from a normal kind of through your service provider to some kind of tunneling system through the scrubbing center. And that had to manually be done. And, and then even in other situations, even if you do have a, a scrubbing center always there, they may not have caught everything. And so you still might feel the force of the attack and have to reach out to them and say, hey, wait a minute, something's wrong here. Can you take a look? And So and there's a lot of picking up the phone going on here. Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right. So uh, when you were developing Mazebolt, were you looking at this dynamic that Chris just described, Matthew? Yes. And the way that Mazebolt uh, started was as a threat assessment company in different in various cyber services with DDoS. What we realized- So you, were you literally like answering phone calls in just the way he's describing? In, in my previous life, yes. yes. I was uh, head of the emergency response team in Radwell uh, before Mazebolt was founded. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the last 10 years now, what we do is we validate these systems. And what we've seen is always on DDoS protection works anywhere between 60 and 70% automated. That means everything's turned on. There is no, there's theoretically no need to call your service provider because everything is going through all the protections all the time. These are the only clientele we deal with. And what we see is even then, anywhere between 60 to 70% automation actually happens, meaning 30 to 40% is not being automatically blocked. What does that mean? It means when an attack arrives, 30 to 40% of the time with multiple layers of DDoS protection, that attack leaks through and takes you down. What we've done is we identify, and the reason that this happens is because the companies and the mitigation vendors themselves don't know what that 30 to 40% DDoS gap actually is, that vulnerability gap. They have no way to check it. We've got a patented technology that continuously simulates DDoS attacks. I saw one of the people in the chat room said, DDoS your, yourself uh, as a bad idea, but actually we think that's a good idea if you can do it non-disruptively. And what we are able to do is we're able to continuously attack an environment non-disruptively and identify all of these uh, vulnerability gaps in the network and proactively close them to make your DDoS protection fully automated so that when that attack arrives, you know you don't just think and theorize, you know it's going to be mitigated and there's no picking up the phone. Ah, here's a good question that came from Larry Rosen. What percentage of DDoS attacks are driven by compromised IoT devices? Do you have uh, numbers on that, Chris? Do you know? Uh, I don't have specific numbers, no. I, it, it is a lot, and we saw some very specific attacks in the last couple of years that were from uh, the Mirantis botnet that was all IoT devices. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't have specific numbers for right now. Are there certain, by, by the way, are there certain IoT devices that are more used than others, like webcams? I mean, I don't know what... Is there any? Have you Unfortunately, noticed? it's a lot of them right now. Uh, a lot of consumer IoT devices were made without much regard for security yes. and without any way to update them. And so they are just compromised uh, left and right. Uh, that is improving somewhat, but but it's a lot of compromised devices out there. And it's almost anything you have in your house, potentially. Uh, and then the, the webcams are interesting because they have other flaws, too, where you know if somebody hacks into that, they're not just causing a DDoS, but maybe they're looking in your house. Yes. What about from your um, from your experience, Matthew? It's uh, how much of um, the attacks are going through IoT devices? Also, we don't have exact statistics on it, but um, we we think that definitely it is increasing because of IoT, the DDoS problem. Uh, not only taking over the IoT, but even using them, certain attacks can be amplified against IoT devices. So you don't necessarily always have to take over the device itself. So yeah, it's playing a big part, I believe. So, but are there? I mean. Are there signatures on the, essentially on the traffic that says, oh, I can see this is coming from a webcam, this is coming from, you know, a thermometer, I don't know what. I mean, are there any signatures there, like that? There, there could be. It depends. It's very dependent on what, uh, like, for instance, if you connect from your iPhone, you'd see an iPhone browser coming through. If you connect from a webcam, there may be some kind of signature. Maybe, mm -hmm. but people, I think people under attack don't really check, you know, who actually attacked me. If there's thousands of people hitting you, you don't really care. You just want to make sure that you, that you mitigate the attack. So we don't see, we don't spend a lot of time in the forensics area of things. We try to prevent uh, a lot of that stuff. So we don't, I think people have pretty much given up when it comes to DDoS attacks, trying to do forensics 
of exactly where the attack came from because it doesn't make that much of a and, difference. And do do attacks, uh, because I've heard that like when they come as a burst attack, it's tougher than, than sort of a continual attack. What are the, I guess, what are the patterns of attacks you're seeing, Chris? Yeah, so there's definitely lots of different patterns of, of DDoS attacks. And, and you're right, obviously a kind of sustained big kind of fire hose attack from mm -hmm. a certain set of uh, devices to a specific uh, property of, of your own can be mitigated, at least in the time that it's going. Whereas if that's changing quite a bit, right, if they're maybe hopping and they're attacking one application or, or one API first and then moving to another one and also potentially changing the devices that it's coming from, uh, obviously that can be much, much harder to stop because the rules you need to put in place are changing as the attack uh, is ongoing. And just uh, writing on that is, I think one of, going back to the automated protection, if you don't have automated protection, you actually don't really have DDoS protection at that point, because exactly what Chris said, attackers are changing. They've become aware to the fact that if you've got any type of manual need, i.e. setting up these rules for different APIs or different services, that's a weakness that needs to be done beforehand. Otherwise, you're essentially chasing the attacker and they might they are more difficult to stop those attacks. Uh, just as a right? reminder, we have uh, five minutes before we're going to play our next game of I Object. And, uh, and if you have not clicked the link at the bottom of the screen to register for next week's video chat, please go ahead and do that. As I said, it will not take you out of this video chat at all whatsoever. Please get more of your, I don't know if any, have any good ideas come in? Andrew, let me know in the back channel because uh, I have not seen one good idea come in. Two, we've got two good ideas and probably... 25 bad ideas. Again, just to show you what kind of audience we have here, Matthew and uh, Chris, they, they are, they're full of bad ideas and we appreciate them for that specifically. All right, let's get to our next question. Um, configurating um, DDoS solutions, start with you, Matthew, on this. Um, this is just a problem we have with all uh, security tools in general. Give us an idea. What are the, the common configuration mistakes that are made? So we see a lot that networks are not covered at all. Entire subnets are not covered, that you've got the DDoS protection in place and someone didn't define the rules. We've seen even BGP protections where customers thought that their traffic is going through BGP prote protection and maybe only 30% of it is going through. So essentially you didn't have DDoS protection. And essentially the updating of the rules, as Chris put it earlier, the configuration policies, I think it's the most important thing you can do and the validation of those rules in an ongoing basis because every time you change something in your environment, essentially those rules need to be changed in many cases. And if you don't do that, you're opening up new vulnerabilities in those rules. Uh, by the way, th three minutes actually to get your best bad ideas in before we put up the poll. Uh, Chris, what configuration issues have you seen? Yeah, so very similar, obviously, but also I think you know one thing to think about is just your entire IT estate and that network. Uh, I've seen a lot of folks who maybe they have DDoS protection in front of one website, but not in front of the back end of it or in front of, you know, their websites and the cloud, but not in front of on premises servers or or vice versa, or they're maybe protecting a campus network and, and not the cloud network. So really just being able to look at the entire thing holistically and understanding where uh, the different attack vectors are and be able to cover all of them and just missing that is, is the most common thing I see. Okay. Um, all right, we are going to be, uh, Andrew, in about one minute, make sure you invite Jonathan uh, Waldrop on to play our next game. And um, let's get to uh, our next questions. Um, what type of testing, I guess, do you do, Matthew, to see how well a, a DDoS attack can be handled? Because you don't want to wait till the actual attack handles and are... Are customers actually doing it? Like, how do you test to know it's working? I guess is my question. So we see that the medium large enterprises are doing it now. It's becoming like a, our radar product is really uh, catching on uh, worldwide now. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we see is they when you do when you use a product like radar and you're simulating literally thousands of DDoS attacks against your environment. You're configuring a policy at a level that just wasn't possible before. It, it, it wasn't possible. It isn't possible. We right. used to do traditional red team testing. And what you can do in a three or six hour maintenance period actually is less than well under 1% of your entire attack surface. If you think about each attack point in your environment, you could have more than 100 different attack vectors against each attack point. point and with a traditional test, you can just 
check a small subset. So companies are doing this type of testing. Uh, I look at red team testing more as human and procedural response testing now, uh, which won't actually eliminate vulnerability in your environment. It will teach you how to respond to downtime. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do see people coming more towards our type of uh, technology that you are continuously simulating automated attacks causing no downtime and identifying your policy misconfigurations all the time. All right. It looks like we have um, Jonathan Waldrop on, but I do not see his picture. He's just minimized. Can we get Jonathan to give it, turn on his webcam and microphone? And we're going to play our next game. Uh, I dropped from the live link. Jonathan, just uh, refresh your browser. Hopefully that'll solve. Well, while we're waiting for that, let me go to you, uh, Chris, and talking about the, um, the testing. What is involved in testing, like what I was asking Matthew, and how, how often are people actually doing it? Yeah, so I'm, I'm really glad to hear that Mazebolt's seen an uptick in testing because it's something that traditionally has been you know, really hard to do and, and not very much paid attention to by a lot of companies. Uh, you know, because on one hand, really simulating a DDoS attack is is potentially hard without causing collateral damage because you're, you know, either well, most DDoS attacks, right, come from these kind of botnets where you've compromised a bunch of machines and they're sending a bunch of traffic all at once to, to one location. And so it's a bunch of little streams that become a big stream at one point. And obviously that has to traverse, you know, other people's networks and things. So, you know, mechanically doing a DDoS is actually doing a DDoS in a lot of ways. And that's, you know, one tough and, and just has been ignored. So, um, you know, being able to use these simulated environments where you can actually test against your defenses uh, without causing upstream problems or, or collateral damage is, is super important and, and is, you know, fairly new, uh, and, and at least as far as adoption goes. I'm surprised it's so fairly new. Well, let me ask a deeper question here and more on the other side of the equation of why these attacks actually happen. I mean, they've been going on for years, and sometimes we see them being politically motivated, and I'm trying to understand what is the financial gain from doing these who initiates them? Because I know they're, you know, they're essentially hiring botnets to take, you know, to essentially carry out these attacks. Uh, Chris, what what do you know from the the value of essentially doing the attack? And and I'll get the, later the second question. We'll get to like, how do you know if you're you're an upcoming target? Yeah. So a, a lot of this has been, you know, either politically motivated or just, you know, retributional or something, right? There was some kind of chip on someone's shoulder and they wanted to take something down. Maybe a new site said something they didn't like. Maybe it's a com competing company, perhaps, and, and you're not quite ethical in your business practices. Uh, you know, I've even seen some DDoS prevention companies attack prospects before going in to make a sales pitch. Obviously, that's, those that's get rooted great. out, hopefully. By the way, we've um, heard other techniques similar to that in, in other areas of security. Go on. Yeah. And now we're starting to see um, ransomware combined with DDoS, where someone will send a kind of small, you know, shot across the bow DDoS at a company, contact them, ask for money, or the big guns are coming out. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. Matthew, what have you seen? Pretty much the same. I think uh, the competition, as it used to be hacktivism. Uh, very rarely did we have our customers getting a ransom note or something like that. It, it used to happen, but not often. I think now ran, extortion from DDoS, you know, you launch a small attack and say, look, you came down for three minutes and it's all very cordial the way that they speak and very gentlemanlike. <laughs> they write you a nice letter, send us a bit of a Bitcoin there. And, but at the end of the day, if you don't pay, you're going to get attacked. Uh, so, that, so it's very profitable. Um, so I think that is driving. And when COVID started, you saw this massive hundreds of percent uptick in DDoS attacks mm -hmm. because they're easy to launch and difficult to defend against because mm -hmm. there's this vulnerability gap out there. You know, keep in mind, malware is very prevalent, but it's not as targeted always. It's kind of, uh, it's spread out everywhere. And when a target of opportunity kind of registers itself, then the attacker will become involved. DDoS is always targeted. So mm -hmm. one, once, once you are targeted, there's a 30 to 40% chance, meaning I launched two, three attacks and you're probably coming down. So, so it's easier to launch and it's very profitable and companies are obviously willing to pay and there may even be some insurance aspect driving this. I don't know, but you know, there are discussions that you know, insurance companies are uh, through third party forensic companies paying this off because it would be cheaper than the downtime. So this this industry is uh, th this kind of extortion industry. I think is fueling it. Uh, right. And by the way, NetScout recently released a report 
that they see that too, and they're pretty involved uh, in a lot of these attacks. All right, we may be having a hard time getting Mr. Jonathan Waldrop. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Oh, uh, Jonathan. Hopefully, we're gonna get him on in just a second. Um, let's go back. So, um, uh, by the way, no, no. Quite, I'm surprised. The group. Oh no, wait. We got Jonathan here. All right, great. And he's wearing a CISO series jacket. You're looking good. All right, very looking sharp. All right, we're playing the game that is called I Object, and I'm gonna give a short explanation of it. Jonathan has played before. I explained before we went on th there to our other two guests. For those listening, here's how it works. Here are the rules. The game lasts one minute, but the clock stops when a competitor says, I object. Time doesn't resume until the judge says sustained or overruled. I'm the judge. At any mm. moment, any competitor can object. Don't be polite. You want to win. So find a reason to object. The one who is speaking on the microphone at the end of the minute, Andrew? <laughs> will be the winner, all right? So you're going to listen for that. All right, everyone knows how to, the game is played. Andrew, you got the clock ready. The, the, the subject is how to thwart a DDoS attack. Matthew, you're beginning. On your mark, get set, go. Start identifying vulnerabilities in your system and start shutting them down. I object. Okay, what's your objection? Uh, well, I don't think you start with vulnerabilities, right? Yeah. I think everyone's... Uh, a Everyone is vulnerable to a DDoS attack because it's just okay. an internet. Okay, Jane, yes. go ahead. You got it. Well, hold on, wait. No, I have. Uh, what's your objection, Jonathan? So I'm a small company. I've got a small web presence. I don't have a lot of attack vectors. I'll 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 wait, wait, you, you have definitely got options out there to get protection. There is no excuse not to have good DDoS. Okay, protection sustain. Go ahead, Jonathan. It's yours. Keep going. Jonathan, back to you. Oh, so, yeah, so no, I'm, I'm sorry. Small... I'm sorry, Jonathan, I'm oh. sorry, Matthew. Sorry, <laughs> stop, Jonathan, Matthew. I'm sorry, Matthew, uh, you go ahead. Automated protection can be gotten by everybody. If you're an enterprise company, you need to invest a little bit more in automated protection by identifying the vulnerabilities once you have the protection. But yes, protection is the first thing. Straight after that, the next thing to stop the attack, identify the vulnerabilities. The next thing, remediate those vulnerabilities and keep repeating it so that you don't go down from any type uh, of... Objection. Yes. Oh, okay. wait, I, hold on, I got objection first from Jonathan. What's your objection? So, I, I mean, we've got to, there's there's no way to know what's coming because DDoS is, is totally by surprise, right? You okay. don't object. have to object. Wait, object. You know, back to object. Back to Matthew, what's your objection? <laughs> there actually is a way to know what's coming. If you okay, sustained. technology like radar, because you can simulate DDoS attacks non-disruptively to validate, and you actually don't care what's coming because you've validated that if that does come from anywhere, it's going to be blocked. So there is a way to be prepared. It's a myth that you can't be prepared. You don't have to have downtime. If someone came to you and said, hey, you can get a, a antivirus solution and when you get hacked, we'll respond to it and steal your data, we'll respond to it, you probably wouldn't buy that solution. The same with DDoS, there's no reason to come down. You can prevent all types of DDoS Oh my God, that is a first. <laughs> Matthew, you had the microphone the, for the entire time. <laughs> I was speechless. That was yeah. outstanding. That was thank you, thank you. <laughs> Matthew, by the way, that is a champion run and I object. I thank am you. completely and utterly impressed. And thank you very much, Chris. I'm sorry, Chris, it didn't go back to you because there was objections on your objections right on, yeah. on top of it. But kudos to you on that. All right. Excellent job, Matthew. I can't thank I can't you. be more impressed <laughs> with how well you did. So kudos to them. All right. If you have not voted in our poll, please vote in our poll. We're gonna take another question or two. Uh and um, uh, we'll take another question, too, and then we'll play our next game, which will be Department of Yes. So, again, if you have not voted, and we're definitely not getting enough votes here, please, people, vote. Uh, okay, so here we, we got some good, uh, some really good bad ideas that have come in already. Okay. This, I, I, we were talking about this earlier, but one of the major complaints about DDoS solutions in general is that they focus on how much traffic they stop, but not on the site, keeping keeping the site up, which when I remember speaking with Alistair, he said, well, that's what the customers want. The customers just want to keep their site up. They honestly don't care that you can stop a million or two million or three million, whatever the heck, because that, that doesn't translate in keeping my site up. So we're I, I want to just talk about that disconnect between us promoting that we stop X amount of traffic versus we keep your site up. I'll start with you, Chris. 
Yeah. So, I mean, it's understandable that folks want to talk about the volume that they can stop because that is right. important, right? At the end of the day, a volumetric DDoS attack, if you don't have a big enough pipe uh, to absorb that attack, you can't stop it. And so mm -hmm. that is kind of, you know, the first step of, of being able to keep someone's site up. Uh, obviously, there are other factors, though, because if you're stopping all the traffic, uh, then you've obviously stopped the DDoS attack from reaching the site, but the site is also down because no one can reach it. And right. so there is a nuance there. And you're right that customers, all they care about is keeping the site up. Uh, at step one is, do you have this, the, the scale to be able to stop the attacks that are coming at us now? And they keep getting bigger every year, every few months. Um, but as you said, it's much more nuanced than that. And what we actually need to be talking about is maybe success rate of stopping DDoS attacks would be a better measure to, to talk about and to tout. So how, how do you communicate this to your customers, Matthew, in, in terms of getting to what their true need is versus touting the technical efficiency of your product? I think uh, DDoS used to be considered a volumetric issue. I think that's no longer the case. Chris is 100% right. You have to have the bandwidth capacity. If you can't keep up with the bandwidth capacity, you're just going to come down. If you've got one gig, I'd send two gigabit, you're going to come down. But... Mm -hmm. What has happened is that it's become a security issue now. DDoS is a security issue. And people who have come down, if you look at Blizzard, if you look at Microsoft and Amazon, all, they've all got great DDoS protection. They've all got the upstream providers. They've all, but they still have downtime. The reason is they cannot identify these attacks proactively. And that's how they are coming down. And the key uh, thing that's missing in many organization strategies is being able to identify those vulnerable points before they're hit. The volume isn't the issue anymore. We, all of the major providers, the Akamai's of the world, the Arbors of the world, the Radwes, the F5, these guys can all handle the volume. The volume is a nice uh, media hyped event, but the vast majority of our uh, customers that used to come down from DDoS attacks quite frequently were coming down from not very high rate attacks. Many times they were under five gig. I mean, a few hundred thousand uh, layer seven connections is just a few hundred megabit. And it's not going to move the bar much on your bandwidth. So you don't, it's a myth to think that it takes a high, high bandwidth, sorry, high bandwidth DDoS attack to take your environment down. It can also be well targeted, high packets uh, per second to certain components or very high connections to certain. It's, but if you don't have the ability to identify the attack, that's where the downtime comes in. And time to mitigation. When a vendor says, hey, I've got less than one second time to mitigation or less than three seconds or less than 18 seconds, they're 100% right. From the moment they identify the DDoS attack, if they didn't identify that DDoS attack, then that just depends on how skilled everyone is involved. All right, we got a call just came in. Hello, welcome to the Department of Yes, where no request is ever rejected. All right, we got some really good bad, best bad ideas. And uh, uh, these are the two most voted up ones that we have here. And again, let me remind people, if you have not registered for next week's video chat, please go ahead and do just that. That link is at the bottom of the screen. All right, Department of Yes, you know how this game is played. You have to tell me why you actually want to implement this bad idea. Again, you cannot be facetious. I'm going to start with you, Chris, on this one. Forward all incoming DDoS traffic to your competition. Why do you want to do this? It's a good one. Oh, by uh, the way, speak up if this is you in the chat room. Go ahead. Yeah, obviously, uh, that's a good way to deflect the DDoS from you know impacting your own services while yes. also doing the double whammy of conducting a DDoS that you didn't have to uh, pay for on, on a competitor and taking them out of the game. That is just... Yeah. Good old fashioned, sound, solid advice. All right, Matthew, why do you want to do this? I think that uh, like, like Chris said, I couldn't agree more. You are taking out your competition straight away and uh, you didn't even have to launch that DDoS attack. I think that's a great idea. So every time that's just a policy that's put into place as it comes through, have a list of your competitors and forward it to them one after another. All right, so I'm gonna give you two. I'm giving you a boo for copying Chris, right? yeah, yeah. but I'm giving you a hooray! I'm giving you a hooray for having the suggestion of just having a list of competitors and that when the next DDoS attack comes in, just you know, have it just as a company policy. I love that. That's such a great idea. By the way, who was that 
Um, who whose bad idea was that? Do we know Andrew? Can you tell Fred Groon? Fred Groon. That's uh, the first bad idea. Ah, thank you, Fred. All right. The next one. I'm going to throw this one to you, Matthew. First, a DDoS attack affects the entire organization. Therefore, reaction and mitigation should be handled by human resources. Why is this a good idea, and how are you going to, and and why do you want to implement this? I think this is a fantastic idea. You know, when there is a DDoS attack, there's so many political ramifications from that attack. HR are perfectly suited to deal with this. I think because this goes on for so long, so much talking, so much organizing, this is a great idea. I Bro! I agree because that's what we talked about. It's, it's always polit- it, the, the main thrust of this was political. So good answer. Chris. Uh, well, I think that the HR department should handle this mainly because they're so used to dealing with insurance carriers. And really, obviously, the best way to deal with DDoS is just to get uh, cyber insurance. Well, there you go. Good answer for both of you. Honey. Oh, yeah! Excellent job. Uh, excellent job, by the way. And so that last one was from Sherman, I believe. Um, so Sherman and Fred Groon, uh, uh, I want you to be available in five minutes to join us to uh, be the contenders to face off. Please confirm that you can come join us uh, there. Oh, Sherm. Sherm, thank you. So Sherm, I'm sorry, you go by Sherm, not Sherman. All right. So please uh, be ready for that. Uh, okay, let's go to our next question. We actually have questions from the audience, which is great. Awesome. Uh, just This might be just a quick answer for both of you, and this comes from Roger Swanson. Um, do either you have a checklist or can recommend one somewhere that exists? Just like, hey, when a DDoS attack happens, do this, and just sort of like, deal with these issues. Had you created something like this, Chris, with uh, Gigom? Uh, we have not. It's a great idea, though, and I'd love to say we had. Um, I have for uh, previous companies, but uh, Gigom doesn't have anything like that published right now. Uh, do you at Mazebolt have just sort of a checklist, like here's what to deal with? No, unfortunately, again, we we focus on the prevention. It's a good idea to have that checklist, though. Especially All right, so if somebody knows someone, please let us know. All right, this comes from Fred Groon, again, one of our best bad idea contenders who just said, and also, by the way, I just want to mention that uh, John Prokev also had a really good bad idea, which was uh, uh, upgrade your DDoS to Emma, MS DDoS, which I thought was a great idea. <laughs> good job, John. Um, all right, if someone does not have any DDoS tools in place today, how should they begin to make a business case to justify the spend? This is a good question, all right? Um, What's the cost model for DDoS protection, number of public facing services, number of, and he doesn't go there, but um, so I'll start with you, Matthew. What is the business case to justify spend? Obviously to uh, keep the business up. I remember having this discussion with uh, Phil Wolf um, and some others, uh, or actually it wasn't just Phil. I think Phil's talked about this, but um, Nick Espinosa, just companies can't answer the question of, at what point of downtime is our business collapsed? Like, how long do we have to be out before it's catastrophic? And so I'll ask you this, Matthew, do companies know the answer to that question? We deal mainly with uh, the medium and uh, large enterprise space. So mm -hmm. our companies do know the question, the answer to that question. <clears throat> I think any company that's reliant on revenue uh, on ent internet con connectivity for their revenue, which is most companies today, mm -hmm. uh, has to have some type of DDoS protection or you're just going to, I mean, you don't stand a chance if you get hit. Um, and then the level of investment that you need in the DDoS is then going to be, of course, uh, how much will it cost us? Now, if you look at what's happened, for instance, since work from home, VPN connectivity. If you were an insurance company before, mm -hmm and you had your agents in the field, if your external site came down, uh, maybe it wasn't the end of the world. Now, if everyone's going through your VPN uh, to work and in the field, now your whole office can't work. So all the work from home made, made uh, the DDoS component a lot more critical now with Zero Trust also. In section 5.2 of the NIST in Zero Trust, they actually have listed uh, DDoS as a major weakness in the Zero Trust because now what's going to happen is you're going to have a control plane that is going to control all the ongoing authentication. And if you've got multi-satellite locations, um, a, a DDoS attack will not just take down your external services, but take down all your internal services too. So really it's a business to business decision. Uh, but if you rely on business continuity for your personnel internally and externally to operate, 
you should be making that case for DDoS protection. Uh, All right. Yeah. All right. So um, interestingly that, that uh, Matthew was talking about, you know, his customers yeah. are mostly in the enterprise space. Um, I got to assume um, that, you know, other size companies need to worry about this. But again, you know, business continuity is not as critical to some businesses than others. I mean, nobody wants to be down for that matter. I mean, it would suck if I was down, but you know, I can survive being down a day or two, you know, it, it wouldn't be, be catastrophic, but other companies, you know, a financial company can't be down for a minute or two, you know, that kind of a thing. So um, going back to the original question, how, how is the business case made? Is it simply just on business continuity? Is there anything else to it, Chris? Yeah, so I think there's some interesting research. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but some of the big content providers have talked about the uh, cost of even just latency on their networks. And, and this was for other reasons, not necessarily talking about DDoS, but I think it's interesting here when you look at this, you know, if someone's going to look for a company like yours and your website's not up at that moment, you have very likely lost that customer. And, you know, adding that up over, you know, the amount of time and the amount of volume of your website gets, I think is a pretty interesting way to look at, at least specifically for the, for the website side of things, right? And so I agree with Matthew that pretty much every business should have some kind of DDoS in place. Um, you can even get it for free if you've just got kind of a small mom and pop and, and a little website. Um, there's some folks who will give you free DDoS protection. And then the business continuity piece is super important for a lot of folks, especially as we've gone further and further into this digital transformation. And so much of our interactions with customers or interactions with other employees are done over cloud-based systems that are ex you know, accessible over the internet. And so it's not like I can just you know, wall off my corporate domain with a firewall anymore. I'm actually stretching across the internet for vital services, vital communication, and uh, all that can be shut down by DDoS. So I think you do have to take that into consideration, even for you know any size business, really. And Actually, also, and also the reputation aspect. I mean, if you're yeah. getting hit by uh, by a DDoS attack frequently, people, if it becomes a public thing, you do start to suffer a reputational right, right. aspect yeah. to that. There is, I mean, bandwidth.com. They they are a slightly larger company. They just lost twelve million dollars of revenue in a single quarter. They spent their entire fourth quarter explaining to their shareholders in a public meeting why they lost $12 million in revenue. Uh, so there is a, a huge financial impact, the reputational impact, and sometimes there could even be a, 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 an additional security impact. Uh, right. Okay. So we're, we're going to bring on our two uh, contestants, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, I don't know, if John Procap may be stepping up, I don't know, but we want our two competitors, Fred Grun and Sherm, to join us uh, to debate why their bad idea is the worst bad idea. Um, but wh while we're waiting for them to come on, here, here's a question I have is, I know a lot of this, because what we've discussed already is right that here. a lot of this DDoS protection is at the ISP level. So for um, uh, Fred is on, you're talking, Fred? You're there. You don't Hello. have video though. Daddy? Oh, I hear your son too. Sherm rejected. I don't know if we're getting anybody here. Sherm rejected, unfortunately. Sherm, uh-oh, Sherm's got issues, unfortunately. Um, hold tight. Well, I'm going to ask you questions. We're going to see how, and there might be seconds coming in. No video for Sherm. Um, well, we kind of want video here. Um, all right. We may not be playing this game, but let me go back to this other question I have. It's at the ISP level. What are questions? Oh, wait, we do have Fred. Fred, who's stepping in for Sherm? Sherm, you don't have video? Is anyone stepping in for Sherman? I'm trying to think. Who's, who's stepping in for Sherm? Anybody? No, no one's stepping in for sure. John Prokop? John Prokop is going to come on. Uh, but while we're waiting for John to come on, um, what are the questions that if I am not an enterprise, I should be asking my ISP? Oh, wait, we do have John on. This will be the question to ask, <laughs> answer. What are the questions I should be answer, asking my ISP <clears throat> about their DDoS protection methods, whether I should be joining that ISP or not? But I have... Hold that idea, that question, but we're going to now play uh, the What's Worst Showdown. So uh, John Procab, who, by the way, I think you can also defend your bad idea too, which I very much I, like. I, I like my bad idea, but I don't know how to defend it in this form. It, <laughs> no, I no. Think, you I think the one I've been chosen to sub in for makes more sense. It's, it's for the human resources, why human resources are the people to deal with that. So you're going to be defending that, and Fred is going to be defending uh, attacking your... Um, 
uh, essentially sending your traffic to your competitors. Essentially, you are arguing with each other, not the judges. So, Fred, you're trying to explain why your better your bad idea is worse than John's idea, or really Sherm's idea. And John, you're trying to argue why Sherm's idea is worse than uh, Fred's idea. So, Fred, I'll let you uh, begin since I mentioned yours first. All right, thank you. So. You know, the biggest challenge of a DDoS attack is, is you want to keep your systems up. So what better way to keep your systems up than send the traffic somewhere else? And if someone else has to take that traffic, it might as well be your your competitors, the people you're competing with day in, day out, and and try to see if their systems can handle that attack. So that I think it's just better just to, it's, it's, it's why the is greatest it example of path the buck. It's passing Why the buck. is it specifically worse than the uh, human resources one? Why is it worse than that? Why is it worse than the human resource? Oh, well, it's just downright evil and lazy. I mean, <laughs> okay, downright easy, evil, and lazy. All right, John, why do you think yours is worse? Well, you're taking a, a very technical thing, DDoS, which some of the folks on this call have explained numbers of times, and you're giving it to HR, which is possibly the least technical department in your company. These are folks who are, are used to dealing with soft skills, with personnel issues, and you're saying now deal with traffic and DDoS. And to go back to my bad idea, Many folks in HR probably don't know the difference between DDoS and MS-DOS. <laughs> so now you're saying, now figure this out. You guys who deal with vacation time and personnel issues, and now 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 analyze packets and tell us how we should stop this. All right. Sherm, by the way, appreciates your defense here. He's laughing here. All right, Matthew, you are the judge. You have to determine which of these two bad ideas truly is worse, which would cause the worst damage. What do you think? It's very tough. But I do definitely like John's idea better. Uh, I think it is more evil. Well, Sherm's idea. Uh, in terms of human <laughs> resources. Sherm's idea, yeah, yeah. Sending that to HR and having them figure that out. I think it You think it would be cause more damage. Yeah, All yeah right. it would be. And entertaining, too. <laughs> and entertaining. <All> right. <laughs> Chris, what, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to have to go with, with John on this one. I think that there's a couple of reasons. One, it's just pretty bad to be evil pretty bad to be lazy. But also, if you divert your DDoS attack to a competitor, there's a good likelihood that they're going to want a retrib you know, retribution on that, and they're going to come after you. So you're causing yourself problems in the future, probably. So actually, you're saying Fred's is the worst, and Matthew thinks John yes. slash Sherm's is the worst. Okay. Excellent. Split decision. I love to see split decisions. Thank you, John slash Sherm. Thank you, Fred, as well. Excellent bad ideas all the way around. I appre greatly appreciate it. All right, back to my uh, question. I'm sorry for all the distraction that was happening. Back to my question. I'll ask you, Matthew, what are the questions, if I'm looking at an ISP, what are the questions I should be asking about their DDoS protections? I would be asking, first of all, uh, how are they configuring the policy towards my environment, towards mm -hmm. my particular environment? And how can they... Uh, convince me that th those protections are going to work when I actually need them. Uh, ISPs are notorious uh, for when you do come under attack, you have very extended periods of downtime, often because it's kind of this insurance policy. And when you do get attacked, uh, you just find out that nothing's been configured, nothing's been checked. So I would ask about that review policy. How mm -hmm. often is this being reviewed? How often do we check for vulnerabilities? What is that policy? Oh, by the way, we have our 10% better poll up, so please uh, please vote on our 10% better poll, too. So, Chris, what do, what do you, uh, what additional questions do you think uh, you should ask your ISP? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, one thing is just really basically, you know, asking that service provider whether they provide any level of DDoS protection inherent in the service that they're offering you, or if this is an add-on you have to pay for. And, and also talking about how they handle DDoS in those kind of, you know, if you don't pay for it, for, you know, models, a lot of service providers will just block all traffic going to you to spare their customer, their other customers from getting uh, hit by a DDoS going after you. And so you just want to make sure you understand, you know, what their policy is, how much it costs and, and, and how it works, uh, as Matthew was saying. And one thing on that is what is their policy with black holding? Because mm -hmm. it's unacceptable that you're going to get black hold because it's too difficult to stop your attack. And then you're essentially down. Black holding right. means just take you off the internet. That's what black holding means. Take you off the internet, leave this traffic somewhere else. Uh, okay. Yeah. Good thing. A uh, good question came in from Dutch Schwartz, who's with AWS. He asks, what is the one thing that enterprises should do differently in 2022 when explaining the risk of DDoS to non-security execs? Chris. 
Yeah, I think, you know, a lot about what we talked about as far as the business case applies here, you know, so the effects of DDoS is really more important than how they work or where they're coming from. I think when you're when you're talking about non technical folks, just talking about, you know, what would happen in the event of a DDoS, right? Website down, communications down, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And uh, anything to add, Matthew? Yeah, I think, uh, sure, you need to explain all of the impacts of what a DDoS attack is, but I think also with specifically regards to the DDoS protection, non-security exec should be getting explained what, how can I quantify my risk and my ROI on what I've invested in? So mm -hmm. you should be able to show your non-technical execs, you know, this is my, my DDoS protection level and this is what I'm doing to improve it especially if you're spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on your protection yearly, you need, you need to be justifying it and you need to be holding the, the, you need to be checking that protection and showing that you're checking it and really showing that risk reduction. That's what I believe most non-technical execs are interested in that risk reduction. Yes. Yes. And, right, and we right. talk about that endlessly on our shows. Right. Uh, Kapil Bereja uh, has this question. And we, now we joke that we should put the responsibility of mitigating DDoS on HR. So he essentially asks, well, then who? Who's holding ultimate responsibility in the organization if DDoS is not being protected? Uh, what do you think, Chris? Yeah, so it's an interesting question, right? Because this is one of those things where because, you know, it, it is, you know, a lot of it's based a lot in networking. Uh, obviously, there is a security aspect. And then the things that are being attacked are often, you know, other, you know, servers and storage arrays. And so it kind of goes across all of IT. And especially right now, where we're seeing a convergence of network and security teams in some companies and in and, and the tools, right, we've got SASE rolling around out there, which is really kind of blurring those lines more and more, uh, or virtualized environments where, you know, the network and the servers are being managed out of the same environment. So there are some blurry lines here. And it is, I think, really important to find someone who's going to be accountable. I don't know that there's one right answer all the time, uh, but definitely having, you know, a person that's accountable and a team that's responsible and identifying that and not allowing everyone to just be pointing fingers at the end of the day uh, is super important. Matthew, what do you think? Who's responsible? We see mainly the CISO as being responsible, but we even now seeing CEOs and boards taking responsibility. We have a major European bank that we work with, uh, they're a very large organization. Actually, the board members have now, uh, a particular board member has taken it kind of under his wing to ensure that this problem is being addressed very seriously. We have uh, also seen CEOs taking uh, responsibility for DDoS uh, in terms of pushing uh, projects forward. And, uh, but definitely the CISOs and C-level, definitely this is a C-level problem because DDoS does require significant budget, significant resources. And that's always happening at the sea level, that type of budget allocation. So, yeah. so Dutch says it has an interesting answer. The risk itself is owned by the business. The prevention, mitigation, resiliency, and response fall into the CISO. Although, like what um, Chris said, I mean, it is a networking issue. It could fall in the CIO's lap, too, right. for that matter. Right. Um, the uh, anyways, uh, one of the ten. I just want to reach out to um, some of the ten percent ideas are voted. This one was the most highly voted one. Is set up an out of band communication plan, signal group, etc., with technical partners in case the DDoS affects the normal communications channels. That is a good, good idea. I'm assuming you advise that to your customers, Matthew. Yes. I think uh, in, when, when they have suffered a bad DDoS attack, it's clear that they've lost control to many security systems during that attack. So there is communication a- Communication systems, yeah, yeah. Right, right, and management of different security. You know, if you've got multiple yeah, satellite yeah. locations with, with, management, uh, with security management systems, it's, it become, you, everything goes dark. It's very dangerous. Uh, yes. So yes, if you don't have different connections, keeping those site-to-site uh, -side communications up, you, you're in a dangerous position at that point. All right, I want to see, well, I'm just going to squeeze one more question in very quickly because I want to get to our, our wrapping it up. Um, I, I, this is a good final question. What kind of insights can one get from one DDoS attack that will help you prepare better for the next one, Chris? What do you think? <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously, you know, the impact that a DDoS attack has on you uh, should inform you as far as what's possible in the future. And so, again, going back to kind of that you know, business case and being able to talk to the board and, and a lot of the things we've talked about today, you'll actually have that ammunition now to show exactly what happened, where the vulnerabilities were. Uh, obviously, one attack isn't going to tell you the whole story, but it can at least give you some clues. Right. And uh, Matthew, what, 
maybe you've seen this from your own clients, like what they learn from one to the next. And by the way, do your clients get repeatedly hit? The answer is yes, they do get repeatedly hit. Luckily today, our clients that have uh, deployed our system uh, do not go down uh, where they've fully deployed it. Um, but I, I agree with Chris that the best thing you learn from a successful DDoS attack is that now you understand what that damage is and how impactful it is on so many different levels. Yeah. But in terms of the actual uh, preparedness factor, the actual attack itself doesn't really tell you anything because the next attack is probably going to be different. You, have, you have no idea what's going to hit you next. What you really need to do at that point is realize that you've got a major security problem. If one attack took you down, you've got a major and start finding out how to harden your DDoS protection systems. All right, let me, I'm going to wrap up today's show. We just have a few minutes. Everyone, I want you to, um, Stick around for the uh, for the meetup uh, next Friday. Uh, click the link right this second because Andrew's going to change it. Andrew, get ready to change that. Next Friday is our topic of hacking data for security, an hour of critical thinking about focusing your security program on data. Do me a favor, Andrew, change that at the bottom of the screen to our meetup that's going to happen in just moments. Whoops. Uh, hey, thanks to your company, Matthew Macebolt. We want to greatly thank you for sponsoring to not just today's video chat, but if you listen to yesterday's. Um, Defense in Depth, which is all on DDoS. It's a great discussion we had in DDoS with the, the essentially the guy uh, who uh, Chris works, uh, Alistair. Um, the, uh, it's all on DDoS and we have a deep dive, 25 minute discussion, goes into many other aspects that we didn't even discuss here and they uh, sponsored that episode as well. Uh, so starting in 90 minutes, uh, we are having our Cybersecurity Headlines Week in Review, and we're going to have Julie Tsai, the former CISO of Roblox, will be joining us as our guest, essentially providing some context to the week's news. And uh, stick around for our meetup. You see the link right there. Uh, you can go ahead and click on that now. Uh, please join us for some one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's always a lot of fun. We enjoy having you there. And then uh, tell your friends to join us. We do this every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, and then we also have our meetup at the end. It's always a lot of fun. And if you want to sponsor one of these video chats, just give me an email over at david at CISOseries.com. All right. Now we have just four minutes left. Yes, uh, less, three minutes left. And I'll start with you, Matthew. Uh, any last thoughts, uh, any pitch you want to make for Mazebolt, how to get in contact with you, how they can learn more about it, try it out, anything uh, of the above? Go ahead. What do you got? Yes, uh, we've <clears throat> we've spoken today about how to prevent DDoS attacks and what's the best thing you can do to prevent those attacks. I think what Mazebolt offers is a way for any company to identify all of your threats, your attack surface, thousands of potential points. We identify all of them. We reduce your risk from somewhere between 30 and 40 percent to well under 2 percent in an ongoing manner. We essentially eliminate your chance of coming down from a DDoS attack. Come try it. You can try the product. Uh, you, we, we offer a proof of concept for anyone who wants to try it. We've got uh, excellent traction from the market. I would really like uh, our viewers to come uh, and adopt the radar technology. I think uh, that that will, the ROI also, uh, the great thing is if you put the radar technology on any type of DDoS protection, it identifies and allows you to eliminate these vulnerabilities. So your ROI is significantly increased with the radar product and uh, your chances of downtime are already close to zero at that point. So here, I'm gonna put your web address in here, mazebolt.com. www.mazebolt.com. I think you can get right. to it just yeah. by Mazebolt, uh, right? Uh, yeah, we don't yeah, say sure. www anymore, uh, do okay. we? Uh, nah, right. And sure. if someone wants to get in contact <laughs> with you, Matthew, how do they get in contact with you? You can email me at Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, at mazeball.com. Let me... I'm putting it in right now. Okay, for you. okay. There okay, you go. Thanks. Um, and by the way, he may not respond to you very quickly because he is actually at a resort right now and it's taken some time off and he's uh, spending it with us. So he's going to be going right back to his vacation immediately after this. So thank you so much, Matthew, for taking a thank break you. from your vacation to participate. For all my right. anniversary vacation. Anniversary vacation. <laughs> yes, we all have to apologize to your wife. All right, with just yes. a minute left, please. Um, Chris, any last thoughts? And uh, if I don't have the links now, I'm going to provide them in our highlights video, which will drop on Wednesday. So we'll include the links to your report and the key criteria. Go ahead, Chris. 
Sounds good. Yeah, you can definitely even in the meantime go to gigom.com and search for DDoS. It'll these reports oh, will yeah, come up find the criteria radar report. And we have an upcoming report on API and application protection, which is kind of the new generation of WAF, which is tied into this as well. We don't have enough time to go into the details there, but uh, some of these other non-volumetric attacks need to be stopped in other ways. All right. And thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you so much, Maisel. Thank you, everybody else. If you have not clicked the darn link at the bottom of the screen, click on it now and let's uh, meet all over there. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, come next week, too. Please tell all your friends as well. We will see you there. Adios, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Meet thank us. you, David.